Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Let's start with the story in which our OP made an enemy, but in what a wonderful way. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Students at my help desk. Not what you think. Once I'd finished college, I ended up working in that same place helping students with simple financial aid and loans questions or small enrollment issues. Now I did have red flags about that job, but needing the money to move out, I took it anyway. My boss was an idiot. Let's call him Rolls. Rolls is Italian and loved to hire old Italian ladies and bend over backwards for them, and they in turn loved to help all their own kind. Now there were three Hispanics, the great one, which as her name implied was the greatest old spunky Latina you've ever met, supervisor, and I. One day I was starting to get tired of the old Italian lady's habit for rejecting to help anyone who was too dark for their taste, but I would help people and go above and beyond because to me education is very important. The story begins. I'd been told by the Italian ladies at work that I need to follow the rules more and follow their lead. That same day, they had a poor young black guy in tears all because he owed the school $300 and could not pay, which meant he couldn't sign up for his last course for his bachelor's. They led him to think that there was no help for him. I only noticed him because I could feel the waves of sadness radiating off of him, so I stopped my cue and asked him to come over. He explained what was happening. Poor kid was in tears and exhausted from five hours of everyone rejecting him and telling him there was nothing he can do. I started laughing and he gave me the most bewildered look and right then and there, I signed him up for a short-term loan that would pay his debt and even got to get him a little extra for pocket money. The poor man grabbed my hand, crying and thanked me, blessing me and my family. I only laughed and smiled, but I was furious that the other ladies had not cared enough about him to give him basic advice. Annoyed by the ridiculous event, I alerted the great one. She was tired of it. Those people were always doing that so she suggested we played by their rules, as they had said that I need to follow the rules more and follow their lead. It was just my luck that the next person I got was an entitled white girl who threw forms at my face and said, fill these out. Oh, my chance had just arrived. She sat down staring at me as if I was dirt, so I grabbed all the forms and arranged them. Internally, I was livid. In my best customer service voice, oh no, darling, I said mimicking the old Italian ladies, now if I do these papers for you, how will you learn? This is the exact same thing they kept telling all brown students when they really didn't want to help. This is the exact same thing they kept telling all the brown students when they really didn't want to help. I could hear the great one giggling next to me. Why not, she asked. Well, according to the state's laws, we're not allowed to ask any of the questions below or hold tax information due to privacy and potential identity theft. But you can fill these out and we can review them together. All of this was true, but we do bend the rules here and there. Oh, but I'm already here. Just do it for me. Uh, darling, insert geo giggle here. You need to have all your family's tax information as well as your own. Now the girl was glaring at me, so I pointed her to one of the Italian ladies, the one who refused to help the young man. She can help you, which of course they did, but legally they're not supposed to. Angry 45-year-old Italian lady... Hey there, darling. You know, you need to have a little better customer service. That's what we're here for. Ah, yes. Well, I think I helped her to the best of my ability, I said calmly. The great one pretended to be concerned with paperwork. You didn't even try. I smiled. Oh, yes, I did. Just like you do. Then why did she need my help? Because she was asking us to do something we weren't supposed to, and it's against the law. But since you have an issue with that, we should go speak to Rolls and explain how you want me to break state laws to help one girl while you refused to help five other people today. At this point, the great one was laughing as I stood to make my way to the back office. She swiftly said there's no need and ran back to her seat. Needless to say, I made an enemy out of her, but I had more students who would wait hours just to consult with me over anyone else, to a point where the staff except for Gio would be furious. And our next story. Why last year's donation to a charitable Christmas collection will be our last ever. Every year around this time, the church that my late mother attended, I'm not particularly religious, nor is my wife, chooses a few local families that are in need to sponsor and request donations for. The donators really go all out and provide everything from tree to full Christmas dinner to several gifts for each member of the family. 
It's really a charming and heartwarming experience to see people coming together to take care of others like this. That being said, since my mother passed away, my wife and I have become silent partners with this program, and given that we're very comfortable financially, we take responsibility for an entire family, and we cover all the expenses for everything. Please don't construe this as bragging. I did this as a memorial to my amazing mother I miss every day. Anyway, we've done this for several years now, and every year we're given a family chosen by the minister's wife and an accompanying list of family members' wish lists. We tend to cover the entire list and make sure that we even get the brands they request for items and food. We then drop the items off at the church, and they take responsibility to deliver the items and wrap them for us. Last year, we were assigned a family, the same family we were given the last few years, and a list of rather pricey items they would like. Oh well, tis the season. We purchased everything on the list, but when we were getting ready to drop things off, we were called and notified that the gentleman, brother-in-law of the minister, that usually takes care of delivering the items was ill and unable to do it right now. Could we wait until he got better to drop them off? This was three days until Christmas. You know what? No problem. We asked for the address of the family, and we'd drop off the gifts ourselves. Red flag number one. The minister's wife was very reluctant to give us the address. Red flag number two. The family lives in a very wealthy area of town. I'm not saying that people can't be down on their luck in nice neighborhoods, but it still stuck out as odd. Red flag number three, we get to the home and the people that live there are not an impoverished family in need, they're relatives of the minister. These complete pieces of crap were and have been scamming my wife and I to provide the minister's wife's own family with Christmas presents and food. They actually opened their garage for us to be able to put the gifts inside and it was clear they were scamming many people. The garage was filled with gifts and clothes. They even bragged that people really came through for them this year as opposed to last year. I lost my crap. I exploded on them. I created the biggest scene in the neighborhood that's probably ever occurred and made sure to tell every single nosy neighbor exactly what these monsters were doing. I then took my food donations to the local mission and the gifts to Toys for Tots. After it got out, the minister's wife is apparently no longer working for the church in any capacity, and the minister is being replaced. And our last story. Terrible boss is now bankrupt. Remember September 11th? For a few years after it happened, the whole aviation industry met a crisis. Many airlines filed for bankruptcy, pilots were laid off. It was a very, very bad time to enter the market as a new professional pilot, which unfortunately was my case. The majority of pilots I knew at the time were struggling to find a job, were in debt, and were ready to do almost anything to fly for a paycheck. Some shameless businessmen decided it was a good idea to treat pro pilots as slaves. I finally got a call, the day after I was already in my car on a 400 mile journey to my new employer, leaving my girlfriend behind, $15 an hour job, had to start somewhere, except it was $15 per flight hour, and commercial flights were very rare. So I basically worked for 80 hours a week without a paycheck. Oh, and I almost forgot, he made me pay $6,000 for training, which consisted of me flying solo while he was resting his fat butt watching hacked satellite TV. And we had to log that flight time in my logbook with him as pilot in command. I had a small room without furniture where I could sleep on an inflatable mattress with a room full of telemarketers right next to mine. Mark was my boss's name. He was wealthy, owned a small aviation school and lots of apartment buildings. He would bring us to bars and restaurants, waving piles of cash in front of everyone. One day, Mark decides we're opening a new airline in the Dominican Republic. He buys a $55,000 airplane that looks like it's ready for the scrapyard. We learn to fly it within a few hours, no kidding, then file an international flight plan for the DR. I don't want to put too much aviation details in my story, but let's say he put us in danger a lot of times. Like when we ran out of gas flying over the shark-filled ocean, or like when a tire exploded on landing because he didn't want to pay for a new one. But we were great young pilots, and no matter what crap we were put into, we were always able to get out of trouble. Everything we had to do was on the very line between legal and illegal, between safe and dangerous. Our plane was a total wreck. Every week we found a new snag and couldn't repair it. In the DR, I had to face gunpoint, attack dogs, organized crime, a maniac investor, but one that got jailed quickly, poverty and hunger. I was paid a few hundred a month and couldn't afford to eat every day. When we realized he couldn't even afford to pay us, 
I finally realized the kind of bad situation I put my girlfriend and I into just to get a shot at a pilot's career. I was more or less a slave. So that day, in my hearth, my passion for aviation died. I decided to end this nightmare and ask for a return ticket, the only smart thing I put in my contract. I had to scare him a bit to finally get it, then I managed to escape very quickly and get back home. That completely annihilated his investment in DR. What a bad businessman, relying on a sole person like this. Back in the country, I couldn't let him do the same thing to other pilots. I sued him over the $6,000 training. Instead of trying to defend himself, he didn't show up in court. I won my case, and when I got back to my car, it was keyed front to rear. The exact day I was legally authorized to proceed, I ordered the seizure of his airplanes. He paid me in full immediately, but I assumed he had to rely on credit cards. I traveled back to my hometown and never spoke to him again. Fast forward a couple years, I found out he lost everything he owned and filed for bankruptcy. No more waving piles of money in bars. No more treating employees like animals. Oh, and he got divorced too. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.